everyone again. And I'll echo those thoughts, especially if you were in choir this afternoon. Uh, we're probably a little bit uh, hoarse by now. Uh, we've been singing a lot today. Uh, but it's good to come to the end of a Sunday and to have thought, oh, I've sung enough for the week. Um, I've caught my voice out. I've, I've praised the Lord. And uh, those songs our Lord wants to hear from us. Um, we're going to... We're going to hear from my favourite book of the, uh, the Bible this evening. If those who know me uh, know, I love the Psalms. And we're going to read Psalm 110, if you would turn there, please. Psalm 110. And we'll read it together and then we'll pray and get into it uh, this evening. So if you would turn to Psalm 110, and I know you just sat down, um, but if you don't mind, we'll stand and read together. We'll read the seven verses and we'll pray together. Psalm 110, and this is a psalm of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that we can turn to it tonight for, uh, for blessing and for encouragement. We do ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would encourage us, uh, that you would speak through me as your servant, uh, that you would speak to the heart of each person here tonight um, and uh, challenge us and encourage us and uh, instruct us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, and I'll ask for a little bit of uh, participation. Uh, before we get into the text here, um, who here watches the news a little bit? A few hands. Uh, what is going on in Israel? Wars. Wars, yes. All of a sudden everyone's like, oh, this is controversial. Here we go. <laughs> um, yes, there's wars going on, isn't there? Do we think maybe there's a little bit of, uh, maybe the media is distorting things and there's lots of controversy, there's lots of, um, uh, there's lots of confusion in the world, there's a lot of hate, isn't there? Uh, for Israel. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world at the moment. And actually this message that I'm bringing tonight is one that I, I preached uh, several months ago in Mauritius in, in the church there. And I preached it then in the context of what was going on in Russia um, and, and all the, uh, the crazy world events going on there. Um, and now I came back to my notes and I thought, wow, this is even more relevant. Um, and it amazed me to see um, how the, the word uh, God's word, it doesn't change. Um, it is more and more relevant the more we study it, the more we consider the world around us. And in Israel uh, at the moment, um, I'm not, I'm not, this is not a message of what I think is going on over there, uh, but it's, it's a message of what I think the Lord um, is going to do in Israel, and what, rather what his word says the Lord will do in Israel um, in the coming uh, years, hundreds of years, we don't know how long. Um, we know the word says that a day of decision will come. A day of decision will come. And that's what we're going to look at here tonight. And you might be saying, then why didn't we just read that psalm? Um, because it doesn't have anything to do with it. What it really does. And, and we'll see that a bit uh, tonight. And, and Pastor last week, he looked at this subject, didn't he? Uh, he looked at Revelation. He went through all of that for us. Um, and he surveyed uh, all the prophecy there and uh, the things to come, the judgment that is to come, especially the, the seven seals and vials and so on. Um, and we saw that there is a lot of scripture, a lot of the word that is still to be fulfilled, that isn't finished yet, um, that is there for us to understand what is to come. And we're going to dive a little bit deeper into one aspect of that prophecy tonight. And don't worry, this isn't going to be a really heavy message. We're going to focus on the Battle of Armageddon and the end of the tribulation and the judgment that is to come for the Gentile world, and the deliverance that is to come for Israel. Um, and so in, in this psalm that we've just read, we, we see 
a, a moment here of a, a dialogue, a, a conversation, if you like, uh, between God the Father and God the Son. Um, and, and we know that because of that first sentence where it says, the Lord said unto my Lord. And in the book of Hebrews, and we won't turn there, but it's very interesting, you can go and read it. This psalm is quoted several times, and Paul makes very, it very clear um, that this is the Father speaking to the Son, and he says to the Hebrews, he says, uh, God did not call anyone else Lord, and did not say to anyone else, I will make thine enemies thy footstool, footstool but Jesus Christ. So we know that here it is the Father speaking to Christ the Son. And we can see throughout this psalm uh, that thousands of years ago, as David was, David was writing, it was looking forward to a time when God would send the Son to earth to fulfill several different offices. And these were that he would come as Lord, as God on earth, um, as, as uh, God becoming man, and that he would come as, as king, as king and as ruler over the world, and ruler in Jerusalem, and that he would come as priest. Um, as a high priest and there is much richness to the words in this psalm and I don't have time tonight to go into the first and the third of those two offices of him coming as Lord and him coming as priest um, but we can dive into that second one how he was sent how Christ was sent by God the Father as kin to rule um, in Jerusalem over this world and we know that during Christ's first coming um, that first Christmas, that he did fulfill God coming to earth as man, um, Emmanuel, um, God with us. And we know that he became uh, the new high priest, that the high priesthood there came into effect, where the, the old ironic priesthood was done away with, and, and salvation was now to be through Christ, not through the works of the law. But we know he was sent at that time as, as kin over his people, um, but very importantly, we know that the unbelief of the Jews at that time uh, meant that this, this beginning of Christ's kingdom on earth was prevented and did not happen. That Christ did not establish his kingdom when he first came. And that's key tonight as we look into the different prophecies. Most of this psalm is still to be fulfilled. Only a couple of verses and a couple of the prophecies there have been fulfilled. But most of this is still to come. Christ came as Lord, he is now priest, um, but he has not yet established his kingdom on earth. And so the moment that this psalm is speaking of is just, historically, is just after his ascension. We can think of it that way, that as he finished his ministry um, on earth, he ascended into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. And we can then imagine this dialogue happening and not imagine it we can see this dialogue happening between the father and the son uh, where he says sit thou at my right hand i will make thine enemies footstool, your footstool and he starts to talk of a time to come which has not yet come and so that's what we'll see tonight we'll see christ's future plan for israel and christ's future plan uh, for the gentile world and as i was saying there's there's much conjecture and much confusion going around about what is happening in Israel and what is happening across the world. But we need to give the Lord thanks and praise him that we can turn to his word and know for sure what will come, not have to rely on, uh, thank goodness, not have to rely on the world media and, and, all the, um, and all the confusion out there and all the theories. We know for sure. We don't have a theory. We have the word of God in front of us that tells us um, what is really going on and what is yet to come for us as his church and for Israel, his people. So we'll dive in then uh, to that first uh, section there, that, that first point, and I only have those two points tonight, Israel's prophetical future and, and what will come for them. And that's really verses 2 to 3 there. Uh, we read that the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, that Christ will appear um, one day as Israel's deliverer so this and, and other many other old testament prophecies they they really they very clearly indicate that christ uh, as the messiah was sent as the savior for the jewish nation he was sent to rule as as kin over them and to deliver them from bondage and we read of that in isaiah 59 20 a very important verse i won't turn there but you can note that down isaiah 59 20 but did he start to rule over them two thousand years ago no, we, we know that 
his kingdom was not established. And so the Jews looked on him coming as a political deliverer, as a political saviour. That's all they wanted. They were under the, the thumb of the Roman Empire. Um, they were being controlled by Roman politics and Roman decrees. And they, they thought the prophesied Messiah was someone who would free them from Rome. And that's what they wanted. They, they rejected Christ coming as their spiritual deliverer and as the saviour of their sins, uh, from their sins. They wanted earthly freedom from their earthly oppressors. And they didn't grasp that they had a far more important need for spiritual freedom from their spiritual oppressor, from, from the, uh, the devil. They needed spiritual deliverance. And uh, to, to understand here how Israel rejected Christ, let's turn to Romans in chapter 11, if you would, please. Just, we'll be going through quite a few uh, texts but I'll try to move through them very quickly. And um, these texts have become very encouraging to me as I've been reading them. Um, as, uh, as, we, as you go into depth on them, and I won't have time to go into great depth on these, but go home and, and have a look at them in more detail if you wish. But Romans 11 and chapter, uh, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 11, and we won't read all the verses. But I'll skip through different verses, but beginning in verse 1 of Romans 11, it says, I say then, Paul speaking, Hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Through to verse 5. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Through to verse 7. What then? Israel has not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall, speaking of Israel, God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. And then through to verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And he's quoting Old Testament scriptures in Isaiah, in Psalms here, and you can go and, and see where they was all come from and the context of all those passages is, is really something quite wonderful. But Paul, here in verse 25, to start with here, he, he makes it very clear that blindness has happened to Israel for a time. Speaking of this time now, he notes that, because he was writing in the church age and he could see blindness has happened to my people. He said, I am an Israelite. A blindness has happened. The fullness of the Gentiles there in verse 25 refers to God's dealing with the Gentile peoples. It's, it's the outcalling from among the Gentiles of a people to serve God. That is you and I. That is the church. That fullness of the Gentiles. That time, that dispensation of grace. The mystery is the church there spoken of in, in verse 25. And it's something that the Jews just did not understand. They couldn't understand or comprehend why God would want to go to the Gentiles. They thought that they had very exclusive rights to God's promises. And they just couldn't understand that, that, that God would want to seek Gentiles to be saved and establish his church among the Gentiles. So Paul sought to deal with that unbelief there and and that the coming of the church, this, this idea that the coming of the church meant that Israel was discarded. He said, no, that's not true at all. God has not done away with Israel. And that is a belief that persists today, that is still very much taught today in many denominations that Israel is done, done with. And they've been discarded and been replaced with the church. And back to verses 1 and 2 of, of this chapter here in Romans, uh, Paul argues that, that God has not cast away Israel, uh, and replace them with the church, not at all. He says, God forbid to that. And then in verse 5, he notes that there are still Jewish believers, uh, but he says, uh, he calls them a remnant, and he says, they are according to the election of grace. They are not saved under, 
uh, the old system of the law, but saved under the New Testament gospel. And then in verse 7 to 8, uh, he sees that um, Israel did not obtain that what they were seeking for. They did not obtain their political uh, saviour there, their political deliverer. But that the election had obtained it and the rest were blinded. And he notes there that Israel was blinded um, from the truth. And they are still unto this day, he says, blinded. And ear, they have ears that cannot hear. And that's quoting Isaiah chapter 29. And then in verses 11 to 12, he says that clearly this, this failure of Israel to accept their Messiah allowed for the church age to be established and for the church, uh, for Christ to establish the church. It was something for us to look back at and rejoice, uh, but it was in a, in a sense sad that it was because of Israel's failure to accept their Messiah and that they are blinded to the truth. The fall of the Jews allowed for a far better way to be brought in and we spoke of how in our psalm the priesthood of Christ is prophesied and you can go into Hebrews and read the wonderful chapters there of the priesthood of Christ and how that is a far better way than the priesthood of the Old Testament and having to approach God through a blood of animals. Um, a far better way was brought in because of the fall um, of the Jews. So blindness is happened to Israel in verse 25 unto this day, but we mustn't be ignorant, he says, the coming of the Deliverer out of Zion is still to come. Israel will be saved, he says in verse 26. It is written, again quoting the Old Testament in Isaiah 59, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer. For now, down to verse 32, we read that God has concluded them all, all of Israel in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all, all humans, all humanity allowing the establishment of the Gentile church, for one day soon Israel uh, will be again the focus of God's healings once the church is removed through the rapture. So we mustn't despise Israel. There are many who despise Israel because they think, oh, they crucified our Messiah. Um, that is why, if you're interested in the history of anti-Semitism in Europe, that was always the justification uh, going back when the Catholic Church would persecute Jews. Um, it was, they would say it was because they crucified our Messiah, they crucified Christ uh, in a warped understanding of the scriptures, a failure to understand these passages in the scriptures that Israel is not done away with, that God is not done with them. And they would say, well, then we must, we must hate Jews and we must persecute them, we persecute them and despise them. That is a false view of the, of the scriptures. We must understand that there remains a future for Israel. And we can, we can know if we're then coming forward into what we know about Israel's future. Um, in, in verse 26, we know that this means Israel will be delivered. And I'll start to move a little bit quicker here. Um, this prophecy of, of, of uh, Israel's deliverance refers to a coming time when Christ will establish his kingdom uh, here on earth, as we see prophesied in our psalm. We, th that is what Israel was promised. All rule, authority and power as we read in 1 Corinthians, uh, will be subdued by Christ and his kingdom over all the nations will be set up. So this, for context, and we don't have time to go into all the dispensations, I think Phil's been doing that and Pastor's been doing that, is after the tribulation, um, after the second coming of Christ and the millennium, millennial kingdom of Christ will be set up. We'll ask you to go to one of the obscure books in the Old Testament, though, Zechariah. Zechariah in chapter 12. Um, and I love this book. I've come to love it. Um, it is a little bit confusing, especially the opening chapters. Um, but it is directed towards Israel and the deliverance of Israel. So uh, Zechariah 12 and verse 8 reads, In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. So he speaks, Christ here is speaking, God is speaking of a coming day that has not yet arrived, when he will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Israel. They're gathered again, together against Israel now, they are gathering. Um, and we know that there will come a day, maybe it's now, maybe it's in a long time to come, where Christ will destroy those nations that come against Israel. <laughs> He will come to defend them. 
And for more context there, this is speaking about the Battle of Armageddon. And if you read that whole chapter of chapter 12, we see in verses 1 to 3 uh, that Israel is under siege before Armageddon as the tribulation period draws to a close. And verses 4 to 9 describes the battle itself, uh, describes, and I won't read through it, but describes the, the horror of it. And then in verse 10, we see Christ revealed as the deliverer, that it was, that it is Jesus who is the Messiah to the Jews. And it's a wonderful verse. It reads, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. The Jews will look upon him whom they pierced, and they will finally recognise All along, Jesus was our Messiah, that Jesus Christ was our Messiah that we rejected so long ago. And they will sorrow. But we see that they'll be saved from, politically saved and and, and literally saved from the gathered forces of this world who have come, come against them. And the covenant of that eternal kingdom given to Israel through David If if you go back to 2 Samuel and read of it in in 2 Samuel 7, this will finally be fulfilled, covenant given to David of an eternal kingdom. So we see their political deliverance there, and then we see their spiritual salvation. And this is is so wonderful to see. If you love Israel, and you love the people of Israel, and and, and it's it's so frustrating to see their hard-heartedness. And we read of the Lewises there, and their efforts to reach them, and so little fruit amongst God's people we read here in the scriptures that they one day will be saved. And back in our psalm, you don't have to turn there, but verse 3 of Psalm 110 says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Thy people being Israel, they will be willing in the day of God's power, believing that that day speaks of um, this end of the tribulation, where finally uh, Christ has his vengeance and, and comes as the judge over and the deliverer of of Israel. Thy people shall be willing. In in Romans 11, we read there of how finally Christ will take away the sins of Israel as they turn to him. And we read that in verses 26 to 27 there, that as he comes out of Zion as the deliverer, he turns away the ungodliness from Jacob. And he says, this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. The blindness that currently is plaguing Israel, that is finally removed, and they turn to Christ as their spiritual saviour. We read in Zechariah again, and I know I'm switching back and forth here, but we read in Zechariah in in verse 10 there of how they recognised the one they pierced as their saviour. And then through from verses 11 to 14, we read of their sorrow, in their repentance, as they repent and finally they sorrow um, that they, it took them so long and they sorrow over that. And then a wonderful verse there in chapter 13 of Zechariah and verse 1, in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Israel's stubbornness will be broken down and their sin and their uncleanness will be cleansed. So I I hope you can see there what is to come for Israel. Yes, they have rejected the Messiah, that is past, and so we are in the church age because of that. But what is to come is that they will be delivered from the hands of the Gentile nations who hate them um, as an extension of hating God. And then Israel will be delivered spiritually as they finally turn in repentance to their Saviour, recognising Jesus Christ as their Messiah. That is what is to come for Israel. But then what is to come for the Gentile world? And I'm not speaking about you and I. Yes, we are Gentiles, unless there is someone Jewish here today. But we are saved, and so we are part of the church, and we would have been lifted away seven years before any of these events uh, come to pass. But the Gentile world as a whole and all of these uh, nations that gather together against God, we, we know the passages that speak of the Battle of Armageddon, but I just want to read a few of them tonight. Let them speak for themselves and just be encouraged by them if, if, you, if you don't mind. And so we'll, we'll read first 
Uh, and don't, you don't have to go far in Zechariah in chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. We read here of the gathering together of the nations from verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. The return to Christ here at his second coming will go forth to battle against the nations of the world drawn together against Israel in their hate for Israel. He's sent from the right hand of God to do this as we read back in verse 5 of our psalm. He's sent from the right hand of God to return and to deliver Israel. This will be the day of his wrath. That is from our psalm. The day of his wrath against the Gentile nations. So you can see here the Gentile perspective of Armageddon. The Gentile perspective of God's coming into this final battle. The Jews will see this as their deliverance. But for the Gentile nations, they will see this as God coming as judge. He will come to judge and to um, to judge in righteousness. And a wonderful passage then, if you would turn there, Joel, another minor prophet, Joel in chapter 3. And we're nearly there, we're nearly, we're nearly done reading. Uh, Joel chapter 3 and verse 2. And, you know, I have forgotten where to find Joel Daniel. after Daniel, yes. Thank you. So Joel chapter 3 and verse 2. And then verse 9. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And in verse 9, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of the war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. In the valley of decision, the day of decision is coming. Uh, where the day of the Lord, that seven-year period, these judgments will be wrought on the Gentile world and finally ending up in that climatic battle uh, where the nations gather themselves together and fight against the Lord. And he comes to protect and to deliver his people. And finally, our last passage, uh, we read this a little bit last week, Revelation 19, which describes the battle in, in more detail and, and puts a full stop on it. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, and we read of the heaven opened and the white horse coming in from, from verse 11. And just verse 14 there, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That is the church. That is you and I coming with uh, the Lord to that battle. 
And then to verse 17, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of the kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sin on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against them, that's against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of burning, a fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. You know, when we read this passage, we've read it before, but when we read this, we should apply it to what is going on now around us and and not think we have to to worry about what is going on in the world and, and the evil that is multiplying, the multitudes of evil as we read in Joel. But we will know that one day judgment will come for this world. And judgment will come even more severely for those who gather themselves against Jerusalem and against Israel. And we will be removed, yes, but we can pray for some like Paul to be saved in Israel now, saved from this horrible day to come. But we will know that the beast, the Antichrist, who will lead the armies of this world will be defeated. Uh, The devil and the beast will be cast into the lake of fire. And the remnant of this world who has drawn themselves against God will be slain. And the feast of the Lord, it's a wonderful imagery, uh, well, terrible imagery, really, um, that the birds will be gathered together to eat their flesh. It, it doesn't end well for, for Satan. It doesn't end well for sin. It doesn't end well for, um, for the hate against God that we feel every day as God's people. And certainly as Israel feels, even in their unbelief now, and will definitely feel when they have repented and turned to God again. It doesn't end well for them, but it ends well for for God in this decision of good versus evil, if you like, of sin versus righteousness. We can thank our Lord that we know what is coming. It's like when we have our announcements on Sundays. We know what's coming up. God's given us his announcements, and he has announced that one day he will bring victory. He will come in holiness, in judgment, and he will win victory over this world. So I'll leave you with that. I'll leave you with all those passages if you'd like to go back and read them. Um, They're very encouraging to me, and I hope they've encouraged you tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can know what is coming, and we are most privileged to to know that. Um, We pray that you would help us to use our time as wisely as we can on this earth until you come in that day of decision until you take us home first before that and and then judge this world. Um, We pray that you would use us as your people uh, to, uh, to share forth your gospel in the time that we have and that we would be faithful to that calling um, and that we would see souls saved in this church and through the ministries of each of us uh, here tonight. Uh, Bless us, we pray, encourage our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.